Now when I was making the last episode, it came out to almost 25 minutes long, which is way too long for the internet. So this is part two, so let's get on with it. Vault credits. Now when I started designing this car back in the early 2000s, I had no idea that Audi was going to put basically a Lamborghini V10 into a family saloon and estate car. The Audi S8 is powered by a Lamborghini derived 5.2 liter dual overhead cam V10. 40 valve with variable valve timing produces 450 horsepower at 7,000 RPM and 398 foot pounds of torque at 3,500 RPM. It is all wheel drive through Audi's permanent Quattro system, multi link front and rear suspension with front and rear stabilizer bars, and with a 23.8 gallon fuel tank running off premium and leaded gas, it achieves an EPA estimated miles per gallon rating of 13 city, 19 highway. Also, 0 to 60 time is acclaimed 5 seconds with an electronically limited top speed of 155 miles an hour. And today, you can get an Audi S6 with that V10. Now does that mean that I spend many an hour looking on eBay and other internet uh, websites for donor cars that might have that V10 in it? Yes, yes I do. Um, I don't have the space to pull it. I don't really have the money to buy it. But it still doesn't stop me from looking and wondering that one day I might do a V10. Here's a quick video on rebuilding a Gallardo V10. Now, all this talk of different engines, V10s and V6s, V8s, that sort of thing, I need to bring up one of the um, design aspects of this car that I've mentioned in previous episodes. The idea for this car is for it to be modular, so you can easily put any engine you want in the back of this thing. Now, one of the things I had to figure out were the engine mounts. To make this modular, I couldn't weld the engine mounts into the chassis because if any of you lot wanted to build this car you'd have to hack into the chassis cut out the old mounts and then weld in your own so I came up with an idea of having a base plate into the chassis built into the chassis mounts which would be changeable would bolt to that and then the engine would then bolt onto the mounts something like this designing these engine mounts, I wanted to do an exercise on watered jet plates. The idea is, is to get a load of plates cut out very cheaply on a water jet, then I could weld them together. So this is why the design ended up looking like the way they do. I also wanted to use as many of the same plate over and over again, so this would also lower the cost of making more chassis. So I designed a base plate had it cut out on water jet and that is welded into the chassis, low down into the chassis. This plate is also the same plate for the base of the mount. The rest of the mount is then made using stock material and being able to be made using a 90 degree magnets so there's no jigs that require to be made. So once the engine mounts were made they are bolted into the chassis like this and then the engine and gearbox is dropped down onto these mounts. Now this was an experiment, I was just 
toying with the idea of water jet, making these mounts really cheap to make, that sort of thing, and easy to make. I may go back to this design and change it. My only idea was to have like a brace or a cradle. So a fabricated cradle to fit a certain type of engine, like a V10, V6, whatever, would then bolt into a universal chassis. One of the things I wanted to avoid with this sort of system is I wanted to make this car as easy to work on as possible. So if you ever needed to pull the sump off, I didn't want the brace being in the way of the sump. That said, it's really easy to pull the engine and gearbox out of this thing. I mean, once the clam's removed and you remove the brace, you bring in your crane and it pulls out. It's really, very really simple. So I'm now thinking, if you ever did need to get to the sun, you'd just probably pull the engine anyway. So I think what I'll do is when I design the um, turbo chassis, um, I think I'll come up with a cradle system that will support the engine and the gearbox. Um, a little bit like the um, Countach chassis I did. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a, a playlist on my channel. Now when designing your own engine mounts, um, cardboard is a really useful tool. You can make the plates out of cardboard, see if they line up, see if they work, before you cut it out of steel. This is really common when people build their own hot rods. Um, here's a few pictures of some um, uh, interesting engine mounts. I particularly like the one with the spanners. Yeah, the weather really is bad today. It's bucketing down. Anyway, I suppose we better talk about the steel I used for the chassis. So I just want to keep this simple and I won't go into great detail about steels and metals. Uh, I'm just going to touch on two basics. My chassis uses predominantly ERW steel and when it comes to the front suspension, which I had to uh, make myself, um, I used seamless steel. Now ERW steel is um, a process where the metal is folded and then welded along its seam. I have a piece here and I'll bring it up to the camera so you can see. Hopefully you can make this out, but that is the seam. So this steel is folded into this shape and then it's seam welded along. Here's a quick video. Now you can't really use ERW steel on suspension. It really should be made out of seamless and really it should be TIG welded. So here's a little piece of seamless. And if I rotate it round, you'll notice there's no seam. Hence it's called seamless. And uh, here's a quick video that will show you how this is made. Let's look behind the scenes of this powerful machine and see what actually takes place inside. The pass is a combination of two power-driven barrel-shaped rolls. This is the piercing point, and it is supported on the forward end by a thrust bar. The bar is free to rotate, but cannot move back and forth in a line. Here comes a heated billet to be pierced. The piercer point makes its first contact with the heated billet at the center hole. When the billet is pushed into the piercing mill, the rolls take hold of it and advance it and rotate it over the piercer point. The powerful pulling and rotating action of the mill causes the metal to flow over the piercer point, with the result that the pierced round slides over the bar like a sleeve over your arm. This combined action of the rolls and piercer point 
form the hole in the center and throughout the length of the billet. The pierced shell, still at a soft forging temperature, is now ready for its run through the continuous mill, the first continuous seamless pipe mill in the world. Now they don't make documentaries like that anymore. If you want to see more, I'll put links below. Another design aspect of my chassis is I try to use the same steel for as many applications as I could think of on the chassis. In other words, I wanted to keep the costs down when I was buying the raw materials because the more you buy of one type of steel, the cheaper it is, rather than buying multiple small amounts of different steels, if that makes sense. But obviously some areas of the chassis needed a certain type of steel but I tried to avoid it where I could. So I had my steel, so I could design my engine bay, I could put in the cross bracing, and once that was done, I could then move forward. This is where I started to design the front suspension, uh, the location for the pedals, and the seating, and a whole load of other measurements were needed. So if this weather stops, I'm gonna try and find a day where it's not raining so I can turn the uh, Audi donor car around. That's going to be fun. Anyway, I think we'll leave it there and in the next episode I think we'll touch on the driving position and maybe a bit of the front. I don't know. I'll have a think. Um, but anyway, that'll do for now. So see you in the next one. Bye.